Today we're going to be making a presentation on mapping of soil erosion classes using remote sensing data and ensemble models. My name is Amano, and with me is Ayomi Day. So actually, this paper uh, it's, it's it's based off uh, a cargo competition, which was organised by the Open Geoob in collaboration with the ESA um, some months back. So. We participated in the competition and we are kind of lucky to came up uh, as the second position and from that we felt okay maybe we should convert our solution into a paper and yeah we have our first published paper. So <laughs> yeah, I'm a geospatial software engineer and Ayamide is a geospatial data scientist and currently we are undergoing our master's program uh, Erasmus. Uh, a joint partnership program between, among um, three investors, Nova IMS in Portugal, uh, UKI in Spain, and the uh, University of Moesta. And uh, yeah, so let's talk about Cyrusian. Uh With a quick show of hands, I would like if you can probably signify if you experienced the heat wave that happened in, well, not everyone came from Germany, but Two weeks ago, an it wave happened in Germany, Moesta specifically. Uh, I would like if you can probably share and if you experienced something similar in your city um, last week. It's wave. Hmm. Interesting. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> so, climate change has been manifesting in several ways, and one of them is the it wave, which is really scary. And um, so, erosion is, is not left out because you know, with high temperature, it definitely exposes the soil to, um, you know, getting eroded because it gets dried up. And there's been a lot of research in soil loss and soil erosion. And according to Panagos et al., it's projected that 13 to 22.5 percent uh, is gonna like, of soil loss is gonna happen in the EU and the UK uh, by 2050. And this is really concerning because with soil loss, it can lead to reduction in crop yield because. I mean, the soil would deduce the nutrient that um, the crops need to germinate to grow. And if soil loss is washing away the nutrients, it's going to affect their yield, which is also going to affect our progress towards the advancement of the SDG goal too. Additionally as well, soil loss also uh, can lead to water pollution because again, apart from the good nutrients, Soil also carries sometimes bad nutrients. So, if erosion is happening, some of some most times this uh, soil loss, this erosion, uh, often gets dumped into drinking water, like rivers, lakes, and this can also affect the ecosystem in that uh, environment. And there's a lot of ways soil loss uh, impacts our lives, and it's, that's why it's really important for us to like study it and find ways to you know, model it so it can help us in making decision. And there's been a lot of analysis that has been done when it comes to soil erosion mapping, or soil erosion analysis and um, modeling. For example, a lot of mathematical models has been developed. Uh, one of the popular ones is the Russell model, or uh, the, yeah, the Russell actually, which is uh, the, re yeah, the Russell model. What's the Russell model again? <laughs> Yeah, soil loss equation. Yeah, it's a really complex model. But uh, despite the advancement in research and in development of mathematical methods like the Russell model, there's still some limitations with it according to literature. And one of them is that uh, it can't really model complex situations like Gully erosion, for example. And uh, beyond, even uh, apart from Gully erosion as well, it can also model um, physical processes like landslide. So. And uh, there's been a lot of improvement in computing power, as you all know, a lot of computing power and storage and cloud, uh, you know, a lot of innovation happening in that space. And also a lot of improvements in modeling techniques, for example, machine learning, artificial neural network, deep learning, and vast collection of data sets. Most of us are scientists, so every day the uh, eyes in the skies, the sentinel, they're all revolving around the earth, capturing data every day not just for a particular day. We've added these satellites in space for a long period of time, giving us a temporal benefit 
which is very useful for uh, analyzing and studying these um, soil erosion losses. So that's why the aim of this of our paper was to see how we can take the remote sensing data we have, the huge data set that we have, and then machine learning, which is an advancement in modeling techniques as well. How can we combine these two together to kind of map soil classes so we can know if a soil erosion is gonna happen here, if it's gonna be gully erosion, if it's gonna be landslide, if it's gonna be other kinds of soil erosion classes, and see how we can combine these two together to advance uh, science when it comes to soil conservation. So now I'll hand over to Ayamide to take over from here. Thank you, Ivano. So um, while working on those paper, we had to like um, work with different sort of data set. Um, we have the Landsat ready data set, a lot of um, climatic variables, um, and also vegetation indices. Uh, we had to firstly look at the distribution of the data set, the target variable which we're trying to predict, and as you can see, it's sort of an imbalanced data set, and this actually led us to more exploratory analysis. This is more of like a feature space where you are plotting different band values against each other. You have the Landsat bands ranging from the RGB to the TAMA bands, and this is just to help us identify which bands are more important to better mapping uh, the soy classes, erosion classes. If you can see right on the screen, we have the RGB bands, and this is just showing more or less a, a linear relationship, nothing really serious regarding separating the classes. So we then switched to the non-visible bands, uh, such as the short wave infrared one and two, the thermal bands, and as we can see, this better separates the classes to an extent. So we took more interest in these bands. So while experimenting with different indices, we found out from previous literatures that um, vegetation indices can actually prove to be efficient when it comes to mapping soil erosion. So we used a variant of the WDVI. And of course, the WDVI is just um, a mathematical equation that takes the near infrared and the red band and takes into consideration the soil line. Well, what we did was that we didn't actually use the soil line, we used the slope value. Because of course, slope is actually really important when it comes to mapping soil erosion. And we called this index um, local slope vegetation index. We gave it that name because it involves the use of the slope value. So what we did was we, rather than use the red and the near infrared band, we took those bands, sorry, it's quite, um, we took those bands from the previous uh, non-visible Landsat bands and then we interchanged them for the near and the red infrared bands. Other derived features we, we took into consideration were topographic factors, vegetation indices, and land surface temperature. We also made use of aggregation functions such as minimum, maximum, mean, standard deviation, skew. And what we did was we looked at different variables that had very similar nomenclature. For example, there is temperature in the first two um, features. So we took like the mean of the values. Then getting to the training of the models, we used decision-based tree models because based on previous literatures, we see that decision tree-based models are quite efficient when it comes to mapping soil erosion. And um, we took five of them, which I believe are really common. The random forest, XG boost, scat boost, BRT, and light GBM. Because of the nature of our, our data set, it's quite imbalanced. So we used um, a cross stratified K fold cross validation. And the trick of this is just to make sure that each um, soil erosion class is represented in each fold. And we used five folds. The performance evaluation metric we used a precision recall and F1 score. And this is just to help us know, okay, how well our model can better identify positive classes. Um, and then we used F1 score, which is definitely the harmonic mean, 
of precision and recall. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we went on to feature selection, which is an, a very important part of our, our modeling process. We use the recursive feature elimination, and it's just you know a, a, a iterative process whereby you set a number of features that you need, and then the model looks for the best combination of, of features. We also played around with uh, hyperparameter tuning, uh, like the boosting type, the number of leaves, the iterations, the learning rate. Then the assemble strategy, we opted for the soft voting. There are two categories, hard voting and soft voting, but the soft voting actually used the predicted probabilities. So this actually proved more important than the hard voting when it comes to the score. Our result AI actually shows that the gradient boosting models, which are CAD boost, light GBM, and XG boost, are the best out of the five. So what we did was we actually turned this into an ensemble model using um, the ensemble strategy. We have the confusion matrix of the final model showing the true positives, the true negatives, the false positives, and the false negatives of each classes. And if you would observe well, you would see that the landslide actually has zero misclassifications. That is, it's all true positives and true negatives, no false negatives and false positives, meaning our model can better classify landslides as compared to other classes. For the classification report, this is the weighted accuracy, or rather the weighted um, F1 score of the model as compared to um, the singular use of just a single model. We see right here that uh, it performs better, giving us uh, an accuracy, an F1 score of about 0 0.86. In conclusion, I would say gradient boosting models have higher accuracy when it comes to mapping soil erosion. Um, feature selection and hyperparameter tuning is key to get a better score and accuracy. And then assembling of gradient boosting models is actually good if you want to rely on the use of uh, the strength of different models. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. You guys have more time. <laughs> you didn't have to rush. OK, um, do you have questions? Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Did you, um, or have you already planned to maybe use weather forecasts to also combine it with your model and, and try to actually predict when soil erosion might happen? Well, um, I would say this is more or less knowing the type of soil erosion you're dealing with, not predicting into the future um, if a soil erosion would happen or not. So yes, there could be studies on that, and I believe that should be. But this is actually mapping of soil erosion type, so you know the better conservation strategies to be employed for such soil erosion type, yeah? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, um, maybe to summarize, so you uh, rather want to build like rather an inventory of, of areas that are more prone also. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Faster, probably. Can't give any more. Which Hello. Hello. Did you test your model across different satellite images? Because I've did similar things, but the model accuracy seems to decrease if you use your model on other satellite images than on one satellite images. Or on one satellite image. Sorry, I didn't get that. So on how many satellite images did you train your model? Because if you train one model on one satellite image, yeah. the accuracy is quite high. But if you train your model on one image and you deploy it on another image, the, the, the accuracy goes down because of the atmospheric influence on your 
colors or your spectral values. Yeah, how many satellite images did you use to train the model? Okay, so with regards to the data set, these were actually point values, pixel values of the bands. So we don't really know how many images were actually in the data set. We didn't provide the data set. The data set was provided by Cargo, yeah? In, in collaboration with OpenGeo, yeah? Yeah, because the, the, the point made was, which is very typical with uh, machine learning models, yeah. um, uh, how good is the transferability uh, on, on more data, you know? How much, if you have a large number of samples, mm -hmm. like data, incoming data, then the model can generalize better, right? Sure. And if you have only uh, smaller, that, that's I think what you wanted to ask. But you don't exactly know how much data we you don't. had, okay? But um, we know one thing: it's actually across Europe, different countries in Europe. So I, I believe a number, like a large number of points. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it was about two thousand um, pixel points that was used, that was provided by the competition. So the, the um, when you say pixel points, what, what's the resolution of the data that you then worked with? It was not set, so telemeters. Yeah, okay. And the, the reference data was pixels that where soil erosion was happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> How did you do the pre-processing? Um, what sort of tools did you use? Um, the Landsat images are analysis ready Landsat images, so there was no need to like you know preprocess or anything. So we just used it that way. Yeah. But then you still had to build the model. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, except you mean preprocessing the images in Python. Yeah. yeah, we used Python and Python libraries or stereo and yeah. Other questions? Okay, in a classical uh, uh, erosion mapping, people are just using the uh, erosion classes, yeah. the loss of the, 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 the we using pers uh, different factors. Uh, the slope, the slope situation there, and the rainfall intensities, and other factors. Have you also just used this, those factors to classify, to come to another type of category? In place of three, you just come with four. It's just deep, uh, completely different categories. And people were just using those classes to, 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 to overcome the, the, the loss of soils. Did you consider other classification schemes, other data sets that can help inform uh, using more than the classes that you had for the erosion, like risk and erosion uh, intensity? Well, the objective of the competition was to actually classify this um, four? four soil erosion classes, you know, to be able to pre predict this particular class. So if, if it's a particular spot, you know, oh, it's a landslide or it's a gully erosion or it's a bad land. So you need to know precisely the type of soil erosion that happens there. So that's the objective of the, of the, of the competition, yeah. yeah? So, so uh, okay, so the, the, you were sort of constrained by the way, the, how the con uh, competition was f sort of uh, framed. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I mean, I think similar question like that, um, would you consider other indicators like uh, terrain roughness, terrain wetness, topographic indices like that, or, or soil texture, those yeah. type of things? Yeah, we did, we did, we did. Yeah. I, if we could go. Yeah. So definitely, okay. we, yeah. we couldn't list all the features we generated because that would take a lot of slides, all right? So we, we took out the important ones. In fact, TWI, which is Topographic Wetness Index, was one of the important variables because we did like the future importance of the features used. So it's one of the important variables that actually helped in better mapping each category. Yeah. So yeah. And you built a random forest model, right? We did. 
And uh, did you explore um, feature importances, uh, um, the, the correlations you obviously did, but could you maybe highlight some things? Would some factors maybe not be needed in a future model? Because you know, if you need more data, uh, there's more processing, but if some of those indices potentially don't have a strong impact, then you can build the model with less data. Did you explore that? Is it? Uh... Yes, we did, and that's the feature selection process. We ah. took out some non-important variables. I'm sure there's some paper. Did you use okay? But did you use uh, like uh, automatic one? Um, Recursive feature elimination. Least so he, he, okay, I mean, if you need to know a little bit about uh, random forest, a little bit. Um, this is the is that the permutation, the genie feature importance, which comes directly from the trained regressor object yeah, or classification object. We used um, XGBoost feature importance. We didn't use random forest. Yes, random forest is actually good, but oh, XG it's boost, okay. Yeah, yeah so boost trees then. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, but we know random forest could easily overfit because that's one of the cons of random forest. It's easily overfit, so we didn't want to use that. So we actually w went um, to use the XGBoost feature importance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, but uh, going to the feature importance again. Um, uh, do you know of explainable machine learning methods like Shapley values or, or similar methods? We didn't use that. Yeah, yeah. so um, something maybe for the future, a comment uh, to explore some of these. These will give you a bit better insight into the model yeah. or a partial dependence plots. Mm -hmm. um, so explore some non-linear relationships. Um, this is a recursive feature elimination. Sure. Um, how, how much of that did you leave to automatisms, or how much did you, let's say, look into that taking the feature out, yeah. how that relates to the real world processes? Okay, great. We had a lot of features that we generated, so definitely to actually look at them one after the other to say, oh, this would definitely impact, or this could not impact. And at times, a variable could actually impact, but because there are collinearity between features at times, it could just be explaining the same process, and you might not be able to tell that. So we actually left most of the work to recursive feature elimination, and then yeah, we we let the algorithm do the work to say. We let the algorithm do okay. Yeah, okay. to say. Actually, uh, yes. I think what you meant. Uh, I mean, in addition to what you just said, we, in the paper as well, we have a section where we highlighted the top most, the, the I think top five important features that kind of helped in the the old model uh, development as well. That has like higher chances of classifying which, these which, pressure classes. What, which are uh, the top the, the TWI uh, is definitely one of it. Say again, please. The TWI, the topographic or wetness index. Mm. Yeah. Which, for, for geographers, right, if you've worked with soil for a long time, makes sense, which is good to know. And uh, it's always good to relate that back to the real world, you know, not machine definitely. learning does it and, you know. Sure. Okay, with that, um, I give one last question. Very good. Uh, I just wonder if you did any work regarding uncertainties, if you tried to assess uncertainties of results and then eventually to map uncertainties. Uncertainties? In what sense, if I better understand? Like, if it's actually true or not, like... Yeah. Okay. Different ways. Could do things like quantiles or ensembles or prediction intervals or those type of things. No, we didn't. We didn't. Only accuracy assessments. We only did accuracy assessments. Well, those type of spatial processes that, uh, will be really, I think this is still a good research field to, to figure out that in some region the model might be more accurate or more reliable, not necessarily accurate, but more reliable than in others. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's still, I think, some good research. True, true, because um, one of the important features was the coordinate. Coordinate. The coordinate, coordinate, the coordinate. Yes, the coordinate, the latitude and the longitude. So, as a core, as yeah, a covariate. Yeah, sure. So that was one of the top five. So meaning, 
of course, definitely, he probably was predicting better in some, you know, regions as opposed to some regions. So definitely, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.